Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, Mike Briggs gives us his thoughts on the cattle markets. Aaron Nigren will explain how the Ag Water Management Network can save producers water when irrigating crops. Aaron Berger will discuss cow leasing. And Lars Peterson will talk about farm transitioning. Mike Briggs is our market analyst this week. We talked with Mike Wednesday morning about the fiscal cliff deadline in Washington, corn price possibilities, and consumer spending. We started by asking how he felt about the recent cattle market run. Feeling pretty good about it. You know, typically you have this is setting up to what looks like a classic bull market rally. The feeders start the rally first, which they did last week. Then the fat cattle follow, and then eventually the meat follows after it. So hopefully that's what we have. But we've also staring right down in the abyss of the fiscal cliff. So that may knock it. That may derail it. I don't right, know. Right. So for for a piece here, we're almost talking about two weeks out. But does that concern you in terms of volatility? volatility in all markets. Absolutely. I think the markets are going to be incredibly volatile because one day it's going to look like the sun's going to shine and the next day it's going to look like the end of the earth and I think the markets are going to be extremely volatile. Stock market, futures market, all of it and I think that's going to be a real problem. And you're, you're in a position here where there is so much potential if people have the intestinal fortitude and do the right thing in Washington that you can really fire up the economic engine and really put everybody in a good position. Conversely, if they don't cowboy up, we're going to have a problem. You know, if you had confidence in Washington, if you knew they were going to get something done, would you feel good about the consumer? Gas prices are down, meaning Absolutely. there's more money in your pocket. So what are the fears there? Absolutely. The, you know, the thing is, is you're, eventually you're going to have all-time record beef prices. Now, if the consumer doesn't have any money, you've got a serious challenge there. So, but there's so many other good things. Like you said, gas prices lower. So they've got more disposable income because they're not pumping it away in their tank. And I think there's so many things out there that can help us, once again, if people do the right thing. Even, even that. with that said, do you worry about next summer when supplies are going to be so low that those prices are probably going to be pretty high in the meat counter and restaurant either way? It's going to be incredibly challenging for the beef industry because prices are going to be high. But let's say they come to an, a realistic agreement that actually is workable, that actually does what it needs to do. I think you start seeing the economic engine start firing up and everybody feels a little better. There's so much uncertainty right now. You get things going because corporations have a lot of cash. If things will start going the right way, you'll start to see some investment, you'll start to see some things go, and maybe it won't have to be as painful as it appears it may be at this time is what I'm getting at. Do you feel that corn is almost in a safe place right here? Corn is at the lower end of its range. Now we've kind of been in a range and you've kind of had to buy on the extremes and sell on the extremes. Whether or not we can actually break through that bottom and go down there to that chart gap that's down around 675, I'm not sure. I think that potential is there. But having said that, do I think corn's gonna stay down there? Absolutely not. I, there just isn't enough corn. I think it's gonna be a real struggle until the combines hit the field next fall, I really do. We saw some news out of Japan. They decided they didn't want any more Brazilian beef. There was a scare there. Does that help U.S. market, U.S. export market? You would like to think so, because Brazil had been chewing up a lot of our ex our export demand. You would like to think they would come back here. I don't know how much of that export demand that Australia can pick up, but you would like to hope that people would come our way. I got to think this isn't exactly, you know, obviously you don't know how a year's going to go, but when we talked last January, I got to think this isn't the year you envisioned when we talk, talked about record corn acres in production and, and what happened here. How do you look at maybe this next year? 
I think, once again, got a lot of potential. You, sh you should have tons and tons of acres. What we did see this year is that the genetics that they talked about are kind of there. The corn that got enough water, huge yields last year. So if you would actually have a normal weather year, I think you could have a huge corn crop, and that takes the pressure off of us immediately. There's such a lack of supply right now after this drought, two-year drought, Texas and now further north. Are you concerned that uh, it's going to be really difficult to build this herd back up? It can be. You know, obviously Mother Nature has got to help us because there's, there's no grass out there right now. If you don't get any rain, there won't be any grass, then you're going to have an issue. You've got feedstuffs at an all-time low, so you've got that issue. And then on top of that, you have the looming problem with more government regulation. You start regulating to the point where you constrict this industry and give it another hurdle yet to rebuilding, you may never rebuild these herds, irregardless of what Mother Nature does. Then you're gonna have feed feedlots start going out of business. Then you're gonna start having packers go out of business because there's a serious overcapacity in both those industries. And so if we get more regulation that impedes us, you're gonna have a real problem rebuilding this herd and you're gonna have astronomical meat prices for the unforeseeable future. Next week, we'll talk with Wade Johannes from Central Valley Ag to get his analysis of corn and soybean markets. Iowa State University says the average value for Iowa farmland increased this year by nearly 24 percent. The average acre now costs just less than $8,300. The most expensive portion is O'Brien County in the northwest corner of Iowa, where the average acre of farmland is $12,000. $862. The gain obviously is aided by high commodity prices and Iowa produces more corn and soybeans than anyone else in the nation. The average value for farmland in Nebraska is just over $2,400 per acre. Pastures across the Midwest have been impacted by the drought. Now as we're beginning the winter months, it's a good time for cattle producers to develop their drought management plans. University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension educator Denny Bauer explains what factors producers should consider in these plans. Well, one of the things that uh, we would uh, sure have them look at uh, would be to put a plan together to um, maybe reduce the stocking rate uh, this coming year um, and, and have a plan to maybe reduce, you know, herd levels by 15, 20, 25 percent. Uh, depending on how much moisture we get. Uh, the other thing would be to put a grazing plan together, looking at uh, delaying turnout as long as possible uh, this spring. Uh, normally our turnout up here is about the 15th of May, and to allow those grasses and those plants to recover, uh, we would uh, suggest, you know, putting a plan together that would maybe turn cattle out, you know, the first week in June. Uh, so turning out two to three weeks later. I know most producers aren't going to like to hear that because that means, you know, feeding them an extra two or three weeks, uh, you know, high-priced uh, harvested feeds. But uh, for the health of the pastures and the grasses, uh, that would probably be the, the wisest thing to do. But should put those kind of plans together here this uh, winter rather than waiting till next spring. Additionally, Bauer says with the high price of feed, producers may need to cull unproductive or open cows. The USDA this week lowered the season average price for corn 20 cents per bushel and dropped the soybean range 35 cents. Those prices are well below their record highs made earlier this year in the midst of an ongoing drought. The cost of irrigating the 2012 crop was most likely unpleasant, and at last week's Nebraska Power Farming Show, we talked with Aaron Nygren about how growers can keep better tabs on their moisture levels with the Ag Water Management Network. The main benefit is just to get something they can use to get a better idea of when to water their, their fields. Um, too many times we hear about ir irrigators that just turn on the pivot when the neighbor's going. So just giving them some tools to get some more information out there of what's really going on in the field. How does it work? What's all, uh, what's all going into it? Okay. There's really two tools that we use. Um, the first one is the ET gauge kind of give us an idea of how much water the crop is using. Um, a lot of times we talk about ET or evapotranspiration. Um, that gauge just tells us how much water is going through the crop each season. Um, the other tool we use is a watermark sensor. Um, that gives us what's going on beneath the ground. Um, you know, instead of just kicking the ground and thinking it's dry, we know what's going on one foot, two foot, and three foot deep. In a year like this where it was so dry, what did the people using this find? How did it help them? It helped them, um, a lot of them, they, they saw the driest numbers they'd ever seen, um, and they still, at the end of the season, found that they did get pretty good yields. Um, so the sensors kind of helped them. Maybe they waited a little bit longer um, early in the season. Maybe they saved some of that water to when they really needed it later on in the season. 
logistically you're using the numbers then and plugging them into a spreadsheet or reading off a spreadsheet to, to then determine between what soil and air how much water is lost basically um, we have a different we can plug them into a spreadsheet um, some people just use a simple chart um, we also have an app that you can use now um, but basically looking at you know how much water do I have left in the profile and then based on that you know how much did the crop use this last week too so if I can replace what the crop used last week I'm going to stay at a pretty steady rate throughout the season. What's the background behind this network, Aaron? When did it start? Network got started in 2005 um, in the Upper Big Blue NRD. Um, they partnered with UNL Extension. Um, Swat Ermach was really the one who got this started. Um, what were you looking to accomplish then? Because commodity prices weren't as high as they are now. Biggest thing then was to you know save some energy costs, um, also save some water. Um, you know, our Groundwater is a limited resource, so if we can save a little bit for future generations, that's always an important thing to do. What have you seen so far? What are the average savings that farmers are experiencing? On average, when we've surveyed farmers, they've said they've um, seen savings of around two inches per acre um, you know, throughout the season. So you know, if we can save um, that much water each season, that is quite a bit of, of energy and cost savings. The cost to it is what, and is there any share here with the Natural Resource District or anything like that? Um, a lot of the NRDs across the state do do cost share on these. A lot of them do a 50% cost share. Um, basic cost, um, each of the watermark sensors is about 35 bucks a piece. Um, so you'll need about three of those per field. Um, then we need a handheld reader, which is about $250. And then an ET gauge is about 225 Tell me about the crop water app that you now have that maybe makes it a little, little bit easier for people to actually see the numbers. Nice thing with the app, um, which is available for um, iPhone and then also iPad right now. Um, some people are visual, you know, so this will actually go back and give them a chart. Um, they can look back at, back at a graph for each week of, of seeing how, what that water content is doing. If you're interested in learning more about the Nebraska Ag Water Management Network, we'll link to their website on the Market Journal homepage. Crop insurance isn't the only risk management protection for farmers. The December Nebraska Farmer explains the new Total Weather Insurance product also available for crop producers in the state. Jeff Hamlin from the Climate Corporation says it provides a way for growers to insure their uninsured profit potential. Farmers are paid for bad weather that causes yield shortfalls. You can read more about the Total Weather Insurance in the December issue of Nebraska Farmer. One option cattle producers might have for feeding after drought-destroyed pastures is cow leasing. We talked with Aaron Berger this week about the practice and its advantages. Okay, a cow-calf share or cow leasing arrangement is a situation where the cow owner uh, agrees to have someone else provide the majority of the care and feed for those cows in exchange for either a cash value or a situation where they share in the cow-calf arrangement where the calf crop is split according to what each party contributes. Uh, that's really what a cow share lease or cow calf share arrangement is. How popular is something like this, Aaron? You know, this is an arrangement that's been around for a long time where we've had a cow owner who's looking for someone else to provide the labor and maybe a majority of the feed and also other expenses related to the production of the calf crop. And it's been around for quite a while. I think recently, especially with the drought, there are people who are looking to retain ownership of their cows and maybe considering sending those somewhere else where there's rain. And so they're looking for people in those places to take in those cows for a period of years until the drought breaks and then they can bring them back to their operation. As we also look at the average age of farmers and ranchers in Nebraska and really across the nation, we see that increasing. So some of these older farmers and ranchers are looking for a way to maybe reduce their labor requirements but still maintain their capital investment. And so that cow-calf share or cash lease arrangement with cows is a way that they can do that. Is this something that's almost similar to the way you lease cropland as opposed to, you know, splitting half the field or every other row, something like that? Is it, is it kind of the same agreement? Yeah, I think there's some similarities in terms of a share arrangement that you'd have on crop ground or a cash lease arrangement. You're, right. you're really looking at what each party contributes and what's a fair value for that and then compensating each party involved accordingly. What are the advantages, the disadvantages of, uh, of cash leasing or if you, you know, take the other option and you work it through the cow-calf? Okay, uh, the, I'm gonna to speak to the owner's portion mm -hmm. first. If you think about the owner's portion, the advantage of a cash lease, it's really similar to cash leasing ground. You have a set amount of income you know you're gonna get. 
So if you have 100 cows and you lease those for $160 per cow, you know you're going to get $16,000 of income in 2013. And then in that case, the operator, the person who's caring for the cows, is taking all the price risk and production risk. Uh, conversely, if just like in any other share arrangement, if you're in a share type arrangement in a cow-calf share, you're going to share in the production risk and also the price risk. And so there's the opportunity from the owner's standpoint to make more money potentially in that type of situation. But if production uh, losses occur or if market prices drop, you also have the potential to make less money than you would if you took strictly a cash lease. Uh, from an operator standpoint, uh, it really depends on what their values are. If they're trying to build a herd themselves and retain replacement heifers maybe from this group of cows, uh, the operator may actually prefer a cash lease. It's obviously cleaner and more straightforward in terms of how you break out uh, what the owner gets and they know what that expense is going to be and they can just figure it. But there's also more risk then to the cow operator because they're assuming all the production risk and all of the price risk. And also they may need to go out and borrow the money then to pay the cash lease where on a cow-calf share arrangement, that owner then would get a share of the calf crop each year. Tell me about the cow-calf or the cow queue later and how that can help you figure out some of the other details, maybe, you know, the, uh, the, the vet costs, the transportation, something like that, where that all gets factored into. Okay. Uh, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension has a calculator spreadsheet that was developed by Roger Wilson and Matt Stockton. It's available at the West Central Research and Extension Center's website under their Ag Manager toolbox, and it's an Excel spreadsheet that you can download. And what it does is what I really like about it is both parties can go in and put in what they contribute towards the production of that cow-calf enterprise, towards the production of those calves. So based on what each party contributes, based on the owner's cow value, what they value those cows at, based on the uh, cow value when she's removed from the herd, interest rates, feed costs, labor costs, vet expenses, cash costs related to equipment, operations, depreciation, uh, death loss, all of those things are included. And then when you do that, uh, you can see what each party contributes and then determine what would actually be a fair cash lease arrangement or a cow-calf share, maybe either a 70-30 split, 80-20, or 60-40, just depends on what each party contributes. For more information on cow leasing, you can find an archived webinar on the beef.unl.edu website under the Beef Webinars heading. If you drive anything, the U.S. Energy Information Administration's short-term outlook could be good news. It forecasts a national average for regular gasoline at $3.43 per gallon in 2013. That's 20 cents lower than the 2012 projected average. Diesel fuel is forecast at $4.02 for this year, before falling to an average of $3.84 per gallon next year. At the Nebraska Power Farming Show last week, we talked with Lars Peterson about moving the family farm from one generation to the next. As he said when we talked about farm succession, that's not always a quick and easy thing to do. That means transitioning the farm to the next generation successfully, meaning that the farm continues and that there's family harmony to Thanksgiving table at the end of it. <laughs> Now, how do you ensure that? Because that's obviously something that's probably not say, or not uh, not easy to do. We we uh, start at the family level or the personal level, so we're making sure uh, through our interviews that everyone's goals and values are aligned. That if there's differing expectations among some of the people in the family, say generation two, that that's brought out in the open and we can discuss it. And also, we talk about generation one. Uh, around issues like letting go and, and uh, what is it going to take for you to be able to let go and have Generation 2 step up. Are we also talking about maybe a change in the vision of the farm, maybe where a new generation wants to take a farm, if they have a new vision for it, if the uh, older generation is okay with that? Almost always. <laughs> uh, both a different vision and a different way of doing things. So that's where some of the conflict is sometimes, is that Generation 2 wants to take the, wants to grow, Generation ones, I've been there, I've done that, done that, I don't want to do that. It's going to uh, put my security at risk. Uh, but also, Generation one oftentimes doesn't want this uh, farm managed by cell phone or by absentee people, you know, so just really working around both of those issues. Is there a way to slowly shift the roles from one generation to another? So it's a, I, I assume this is a transitional process, not on, you know, day X, it all changes hands. Well, if people don't plan on day X, it changes hands. <laughs> Uh, hopefully exactly what you said, that there's uh, a gradual change 
And that one way that that's really helpful is that G, generation two, G2, can be tested along the way. So it's really to also determine if G2 can and will step up, not just if G1 can let go. What are those tests? Just more and more responsibility and more independent decision making, more input into how the operations run. What about the financials, both uh, running the financials and getting a part of the return? That's, that's a crucial part. Um, and one of the other parts of that is Generation One will not let go if two things are at risk. First is financial security. Unless they can let go in a way that doesn't put their retirement at stake, they won't let go. And if they think family harmony could be disrupted, they also won't let go. How hard is it to train? I mean, overall, even when you sit down and talk with people, how hard is it for them to let go of the farm and give it on to the next generation, even if it's family? You know, sometimes it's very, very hard, sometimes it's not. The times when it doesn't seem to be so hard is when someone we're working with, Generation One, has been through a really tough transition themselves where their father didn't let go, and so they understand that. What if it doesn't go right? Have you had those situations? We've had plenty of those. And what happens <laughs> well, there? We get called in when it doesn't go right. <laughs> what <laughs> no. happens? I mean, how do you reconcile? Is there, is there something to be done? Uh, I mean, sometimes it's kind of a mediation process, um, but a lot of times it's just getting people back to the table and, and communicating and also helping everyone understand what each person wants. Um, so that they, you know, sometimes people think they're miles apart and they're really not at, at the end of the day. So what's the, uh, the step one? If people are out there, if there's a family farm that they're looking to transition, what would you advise is the simplest thing for them to do to start off? If it's generation one, get real clear on what you want and, and if you're financially secure or not, and get real clear on uh, the family harmony piece, what's likely to happen and what steps you might take. And the second generation? Second generation, uh, don't push too hard because the harder you push, the harder G1 will push back. Uh, and also get real clear about what you want and uh, if you're on farm, really keep in mind what it means to treat the off farm people fairly. I'm working with a family right now where generation two, the ones on the farm, don't want anything that compromises their growth. So they want all the farmland, period. Uh, the first generation says, no, you're not getting all the farmland, period. You know, so just some understanding about what the other G2 members might be thinking. Now with his weekly weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we are again once again for the weekly forecast. As we talked about last week, the first system that we were expecting to come through during the weekend and drop some accumulating snowfall across the state pretty much petered out and the main snow activity lifted to our north. We had blizzard-like conditions across the Dakotas and then that also moved eastward into Wisconsin and there was a decent foundation of three to up to 12 inches of snow that fell with that system and it is significant that it brought the overall snowpack from along the Canadian border all the way down into the southern sections of South Dakota and that is important because with that snowpack in place, if we can keep it in place, any air that moves across southern Canada into the northern part of the United States is not going to see the modification of the air mass like we've seen last winter where there was a lack of snow cover. So I look at this as a positive. The one thing that we are looking for is can we continue to see systems move across the state and second, can we generate significant moisture with these systems and that's been problematic. Systems that have been moving out of the western United States have been moving at too rapid of a pace to really entrain a lot of moisture from the Gulf into our region and therefore it's a very limited amount of moisture that these systems can work on. So we are grateful that the system that just moved in over the last 24 hours that I kind of hinted at last week did produce some significant moisture in terms of about a quarter inch to upwards of three quarter inch of rainfall and we are seeing a little bit of snow on the back side of it, nothing significant. But unfortunately, we're going to have to wait for a few more days before we see another precipitation event. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see how this week plays out and see whether or not we have any chance for some snowfall for a white Christmas. So the first thing I'll draw your attention to, the main system that crossed the state now is sitting over Wisconsin. We've got some residual energy with the, the trough in the southwest, but this doesn't look like it's going to amount to anything. As it moves eastward, it's going to fade out, but specifically when it hits the drier air mass in western Texas and western Oklahoma. Now as we go to tomorrow, what we're going to notice is the cold air does set into the region 
We do see a little bit of positive activity in terms of precipitation in Missouri, and some of that will spread into Illinois and Indiana, but it doesn't look to be a significant event. More importantly, as the system up to the northwest, as this starts to move toward the Great Lakes, we're going to see a much strengthening pattern across the eastern United States as we get into the midweek period. So as we go into Monday, what we will notice is this first wave of energy is going to dive down, so there should be a significant amount of snow that will possibly fall across the Dakotas, possibly hitting into northern Iowa, and this will move toward the Great Lakes. You'll notice that our flow is from the northwest, so we should see some fairly cool conditions at least early in the week, and by the time Tuesday comes around, we're going to start to see that cold air shift toward the Ohio River Valley, and we do expect to see some significant moisture across the eastern Corn Belt and potentially across the southeastern United States. For us here in the center part of the country, we're going to see uh, warm temperatures warming with this ridge in play, and as it slides toward the southeast, we're still going to keep a southwesterly flow, so we do have a couple days of temperatures that are going to be fairly comfortable for this time of the year. Now, as we get to Wednesday, we'll notice that some of that energy from that trough tries to make it in and it's kind of breaking apart over the mountains. And there is a possibility that we could see some light upslope flow conditions with light sprinkles or possibly snow in the panhandle. But right now, nothing significant. By the time we get to Thursday, what we're going to notice is, is that energy starts to regenerate itself over the northern plains. So we do expect some accumulating snowfall to reinforce that snowpack over Minnesota. And we turn our attention to the southwest where another piece of energy coming in with that trough across the western United States is expected to move into the southwest. Unfortunately, by Friday, what the models are indicating is that it rapidly moves out. I think this might be a little too aggressive. If this thing slows down, we'll see a much more significant event coming into Nebraska next weekend. If it takes this pace, we are going to see maybe some upslope flow, once again, across western Nebraska with little in the way of significant precipitation in eastern Nebraska. Now, in terms of the temperatures, what we are looking at is temperatures that will slowly cool this weekend, and then we'll start to see a moderating trend as we get into Monday, Tuesday time frame before we start to see cooler air move in with a chance of precipitation next week. In terms of the 8 to 14 day forecast, they are looking for warmer conditions from next Thursday to the following Tuesday. In terms of precipitation, a drier trend is firmly in the models. Thanks Al. If you missed any interviews from today, they're archived on the Market Journal website and YouTube pages. Next week, Wade Johannes from Central Valley Ag will be our marketing analyst. And we'll report from the Soybean Day and Machinery Expo in Wahoo. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.